Good morning, church. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. If you would you'd stand, we're gonna worship. Come on. Put your hands together this morning. shadows step out of the grave come on break into the wild and don't be afraid come on we say run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit Open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark. Into the fullness of His love For the Spirit is here Let there be freedom Let there be freedom Yeah, we believe that this morning That there's freedom in Jesus, amen Oh, we lift you up Come on, let's declare this this morning We say the fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake. Waiting for 
for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace says, come on, we say Just sing us together. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise, I'll raise a hallelujah. Sing a little louder. 
we say that you are in control. God, you have authority over everything. Church, I just want you to say that to yourself. God, you have authority over my life. You have authority over my health. And God, I trust in you. It says in the Psalms that, you know, the, the, bat, the horse can be prepared for battle, but ultimately it's God who wins the war. He is in control. God, we thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty. God, we raise a hallelujah. God, we lay our burdens at your feet and we thank you for taking them from us and giving us life. We praise you, God. We glorify you. Yes. Glory, show us your glory. 
morning. Sing it with me. We sing chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Lies healed, hope found here now. Jesus, you change everything.
wide with hands lifted high. Come on, lift your hands. We'll fight with our praise. Hear me look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on, we say. getting to worship with you as well. Come on, let's just give a, a big, big round of applause for those watching online. Well, we love you so much. I'm so glad you're here. If you would, um, turn around to your neighbor, give them a big wave. Go. Hey everybody, Pastor Jeff here. The communicator giving the message today is Pastor Zach Greider. I love this brother. He's like a son to me. He's been with us around the world, literally. We love he and Miranda. What great pastors they are. And I love the way he communicates. I love the way he pitches while he's preaching. He used to be a pitcher and you'll watch, you'll see a curveball, you'll see a fastball, and you'll know that he's excited to teach you the word because he always loves to bless God's people. Get ready. Pay attention. It's going to be good. Awesome. Well, good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? Come on, man. I'm excited to be in the Lord's house today. Man, I am just so thrilled to be able to communicate today God's word to you. Um, and man, I just want to give a shout out again. I know, I know some of you may get tired of hearing this, but I just want to give a shout out to all of our Fort Worth family, our Mineral Wells family, our Graham family watching online. So church, can we give it up for them one more time? Man, we love you guys so, so much. Now listen, I know lots of you are watching online right now from all different kinds of places. I mean, some of you are probably sitting in Hell's Gate right now on your cell phone having church, all right? Uh, some of you are on Possum Kingdom Lake, maybe you're on Lake Granberry, maybe you're at the ocean, maybe you're sitting at home. Wherever you are right now watching, we have an awesome team at our Fort Worth campus, our Mineral Well campus, and even here in Graham right now that is excited and willing to engage with you online. So just for a little bit of fun, right now, wherever you're watching, 
watching from, I want you to post where you're watching from. Maybe it's the lake. Tell us the lake, the place, the ocean, wherever you are so that we can be jealous and repent later, all right? Let us know where you're at. We want to engage and have a conversation with you. And by the way, at any point during this message, if, if you have any questions about High Ridge Church, those of you that are watching online, um, again, we have a team sitting right now ready to conversate with you. And so if you have any questions, make sure that you ask them so that we can get you connected to High Ridge Church. But please don't ask them ridiculous things like aliens and are there dinosaurs. Don't, don't ask them things like that, all right? Just ask them questions about church because we would love to engage with you. And then one last favor I need you to do for me right now, if you look at the bottom right of your screen, um, there's a share button. If you will click that share button, what our studies have shown is that the more shares a message gets, the more people actually get to see it. And so I want to highly encourage you. One of the ways, you may not be sitting in this room right now, but you can share the gospel because we are going to share the gospel today. Amen. One of the ways you can share the gospel is by pushing that share button because lots and lots more people are going to be able to watch this message. And again, so glad you're with us this morning. Man, we miss you and we love you so much. So High Ridge Church, one more time, show them some love online. We love you guys. Yes. Well, listen, this morning uh, we are continuing in our summer series that we are calling I Am The Church. Everyone say, I am the church. Come on, with some conviction. I am the church. Yes, so we are spending the entire summer, um, seven weeks on this series, on this idea of I am the church. And man, what better time, I know in my lifetime, um, what, a, what a great opportunity right now in the history of our world to be really digging into what is the purpose of the church. Who is the church? Who is the church? What is the church? And those are the questions that we're going to be asking and answering over uh, the course of this series. In fact, if you've missed any of the past few weeks, this is our third week in this series, I would highly encourage you to go online, highrichchurch.com, and you can watch those messages. Uh, But a couple of questions that we've answered during the series, the first one was this, what is the church? And what we looked at in week one is that we get the word church, the English word church, from the Greek word ekklesia. And what I showed you in week one is what that Greek word actually means. And it simply means this. It's this idea of a group of people who have been called out of something for something. So what I showed you in week one is that and reminded you for every one of you that call yourselves a Christian, which means at some point in time in your life, by the way, you're not born into Christianity. You surrender your life to Jesus. It's a moment. It's an encounter. For every single one of you here today and those watching online that call yourself a Christian, which means there was a moment in your life where you surrendered your life to Jesus, you are um, ecclesia. You are a people that have been saved from something. And the reminder here is that God loved you so much that despite your sin, your mistakes, whether you've sinned one time or a billion times, whether you have small sin or big sin, the Bible teaches us that if we have sinned even once, we have been separated from God. And the beauty of the gospel is that God loved us so much so that he didn't want to leave us in that state. So he sent his son to die on the cross for us. So when we surrender to that relationship, Jesus, now we are bridging that gap, or Jesus is bridging that gap, if you will, and that relationship we have with God. So we've been saved from eternity, separated from God in a place called hell. So we've been saved from something. But what I wanted you to see in week one, and something I want to continue to champion throughout this series, you have not just been saved from something, you've been saved for something. And I love this idea because there are so many Christians who have surrendered their life to Jesus. Maybe it was at Easter, maybe it was with a friend or at church camp or on church one Sunday. You said a prayer and you gave your life to God. And there are so many Christians who are now asking the question, well, now what? Okay, now I'm saved. I got my get out of hell free card. All right, like what is, what, what's next? What more is there for me as a Christian? Do I just go to church on Sunday? And the beauty of the gospel is that there is so much more. And we know this again because God didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something. And so the question that we're going to be answering over the next several weeks, we're moving into this, this idea of answering the question, okay, now what is the purpose of the church then? Because listen to me, friends, God does not just want to know you. He doesn't just want to save you. He has so much more for you. That's why our our vision at High Risk Church is to strengthen people for life by helping them know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. But what so many Christians, the trap, and I was one of these Christians, the, the trap that so many Christians fall into is just knowing God. 
Okay, so I, I asked for forgiveness of my sin. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was baptized in water. I'm good. What's next? And the beauty of the gospel is that God has a plan for your life. He didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something, and he has a plan. Now, our responsibility as believers is to go on this lifelong journey of discovering what that plan actually is. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what is the purpose Okay, so the church exists. Okay, why does the church exist? And you, friend, are the church. I am the church. It's not just a building. Those of you watching online, you are the church. But why do we exist? Why does ecclesia need to exist in a part of God's plan? And that's what we're going to be looking at. And so today we're going to answer that question. One of the ways we're going to answer that question is by looking at what we refer to in church and what scripture refers to as spiritual gifts. And so we're going to be looking at these throughout scripture today. We're going to be defining those. I'm going to share the idea with you that every single one of you have a spiritual gift, something that God has given to you that makes you unique, something he's given to you that's going to help you build the church and be the person that God has called you to be. Amen. So that's what we're going to look at today. So let's pray as we get ready to dig into God's word. Lord, we lift you up today. And God, I just pray over the next few minutes, Lord, that you would use my voice to build and encourage your people. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. God, we pray for our country. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for safety. We pray for those that are sick. Um, Lord, we pray for everyone in this time in, in history, Lord, that you would just continue to strengthen us and give us the ability and the courage to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Now, now, here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to look at uh, the three different categories of spiritual gifts that we find in Scripture. Um, and I'm just going to read over those passages. And, and here's what I'm going to do today. I really felt hard about this, man. How do I do this? Because um, in the three categories of spiritual gifts we find in the New Testament, if you combine all those gifts, there are 21. Um, and, and I don't have enough time in the next 23 minutes and 57 seconds to go over each one of those gifts with you. So here's what I thought. What I would do is just share with you and define which each one of those categories are. I would read you the passages, and my hope is that you would go and spend time in God's Word and search some of these things out for yourself. But what I'm really going to hone in on today, the question that I really want to answer when it comes to spiritual gifts is why do we have spiritual gifts? And if I can get you to grab hold of that idea, then my hope is that you would go on this journey to, dis- to discovering who God has made you to be. Amen? All right, so let's look at this together. First, let's define what a spiritual gift actually is. Because, I mean, a lot of us, depending on what denomination you were raised in or how exposed to church you've been, maybe you're new to church, maybe you're not even a believer, you're watching online, you just, got, you just came across this, you're like, what is a spiritual gift? Um, a lot of us could have different definitions or not even know what this actually means. And so let me read you this very simple definition of a very complex topic. A spiritual gift is any, everyone say any, any, everybody don't want to say any. Yes, any spiritual ability. It's any, any gift that is an ability that has been empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church. Let me read that again because I butchered it a little bit. All right. A spiritual gift is any ability. I love this. Any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church. Now, it's important you understand, we're going we're gonna to go over these lists of spiritual gifts that we find in the New Testament. But if you see a gift on there, maybe you have something that you're good at. Maybe you're a great businessman. Maybe you're an incredible stay-at-home mom. Maybe there's a gift that you have that you may not see in one of these lists. What I love about this definition of spiritual gifts, again, it's any ability that has been empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is used to build the church. So I don't, I don't want any of you to look or hear one of these lists and go, man, I don't see any of those things in my life. Now, I am going to show you one of these uh, categories of spiritual gifts, which every single person does have. I would just argue that you haven't discovered it yet. Nonetheless, I want you to understand and hold on to this idea that God has a plan for your life. Again, remember, he didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something. All right, so let's go over these three uh, different categories of spiritual gifts really quickly. All right, the first one we find in scripture is called what we refer to as ministry gifts. There are five, everyone say five, five of these gifts. 
We found these in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Here's what it says. And he, this is God, the Holy Spirit, uh, gave the apostles... The prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors, if you will, teachers to equip. Everyone say equip. I love this. Circle it in your Bible. Highlight it on your phone or your tablet. Equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for building up the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church, the ecclesia, you, me, So what we first see, and one thing I want to point out briefly with these spiritual gifts, not everyone has one of these gifts. Now, you can go and evangelize. You can go share uh, Jesus. uh, uh, You can go and prophesy. You can can go and, and teach someone scripture. But these are gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit to some. And what I love about this passage is it reminds us of why these offices within the church exist. Listen, my job, and I want you to hear this. This is so important. My job... As a pastor, because these are one of my gifts, I have two, uh, prophecy, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Don't freak out on that yet. Those you watching on, don't, don't check out. I'll explain it, all right? Um, prophecy and being a pastor. Now, listen, what this scripture is telling me as a pastor, it is not my job to do all the ministry of the church. Now, listen, I, I don't know about you, but I was raised in a church that was a great church. I love the church that I was raised in. But I was raised in a church where the pastor was expected to do everything. He did all the ministry. He did all the hospital visits. He did all the weddings. He did all the funerals. He did all the prayer. He did all the preaching. He led everyone to the Lord. He did all the baptizing. And what I realized as I was growing up and studying scripture, that is not the way that God designed it. For these offices, our job is to equip the saints. Who are the saints? You. You. Those who have professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. My job, I love this right here. My job is to be your tour guide. My job is to help you go on this journey of discovering who God has called you to be. And this gift that you have within you. So here's what I love. And and listen, it's not easy doing this. And sometimes I, I, I get people who are offended or upset or have been hurt. Well, Pastor Zach didn't call me or Pastor Zach didn't show up. And then my question is always this. But did someone who is a believer, were they there for you? And what I love hearing is, oh, yeah, my group was there for me. My group was texting me. My group leader came and visited me. Because then I'm like, yes, man, then I'm doing my job. Because, listen, if I do all the ministry, if Pastor Jeff does all the ministry, if Pastor Dan does all of the ministry, watch this, then what is your purpose? Our purpose and my job, how I will be evaluated from the Lord is whether I equipped you or not. And so my job is to help you. Now, that does not remove my responsibility. It doesn't mean I get to sit at home and do nothing. No, what it means is that I'm equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's what the the purpose of these gifts are. Now, I love this because here's what it shows you, my friend. It, It shows you that you have a part in this plan. Your job is not to sit on the sidelines and cheer these gifts on. Go apostles, go pastors. No, your job is to get in the game with us. And I love this because what it means is that God has a plan for your life. Again, reminding you that he did not just save you from something. He saved you for something. So this is the first group of gifts that we find in scripture. The second is this, the manifestation gifts. There are nine of these. Now, these are the ones that are more controversial. Uh, There are a lot of people who are more interested in these manifestation gifts. Now, I would argue that all the gifts that we're looking at are supernatural, but but these are the ones that are are, are a little different than the ministry gifts and the other gifts we're going to look at in just a moment. But we find this list of gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. So bear with me. We're going to have it on the screen, but I want you to hear this in context. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. This is important. So what are the manifestation gifts? They're a manifestation. Here's another way of thinking about it. This is the Holy Spirit revealing himself through your life. So the gifts that we're about to, to read out and listen to, watch this, it ain't about you. These gifts aren't about you. You're just the vessel. That's all. And so be careful with that, friend, and understand what the purpose of the manifestation gifts are. It is for the common good. It is the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Because again, the Bible tells us when you surrendered your life to Jesus, 
When, when that, you were at rock bottom in your life and you said, okay, God, take it. I, I, I'm surrendering my life to you. In that moment, what the Bible teaches is that in that moment of surrender, God places his spirit, the Holy Spirit, capital H, capital S, he places his spirit within you. And that spirit now is going to have manifestations if you have one of these gifts. And he's going to show those through his life, through your life. It goes on, for to one is given through the spirit of utterance of wisdom. And to another, utterance of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. All these, everyone say all. This is, this is important. Listen to me, this is important. Especially depending on your denominational background. All these are empowered by one in the same spirit, capital S, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So what is the purpose of manifestation gifts? It's for the common good. It's the Holy Spirit revealing himself through those who he has empowered and given these gifts to. So that's our second category. Number three. I know you want to dig deeper into a lot of those things. I want you to go on that journey, all right? Go spend some time in God's word because we definitely don't have time today. Number three, motivational gifts. I love this one right here. These are one of my favorite categories. Motivational gifts. We find these in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, four through eight. Here's what it says. For as in one body, we have many members. Again, you are a member, okay? If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you're a member. That's why we have membership class. That's why we call people who have surrendered their life to Jesus and committed to a local church a member. We got that verbiage from the scripture because the scripture oftentimes when referring to you as an individual within the body of Christ calls you a member of the body. That's free. That wasn't in my notes. Here you go. Have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Hey, I love this. You get to be different. Man, I love this right here. You get to be different. In other words, you get to be who God has created you to be. And you need to be that person because there has never been a you, and there will never be another you. You are important. You are a part of this because God has decided you're important. Not because you're awesome, but again, because Jesus was awesome for you. Amen? And not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Listen to me, church. We have different gifts. And my gift may be different than your gift. And your gift may be different than your spouse's gift. And those of you watching online, your gift may be different than your children's gift. Now watch this. The difference in your gift has been decided by your creator. See, I didn't like that too much. Let me say it again. Your gifts differ, are different because your creator has decided that. Now, here's why I say that. Stay away from the spirit of comparison. What, what entraps so many Christians. And I, and I would say this. This idea and this thought that I'm about to share with you, I think sidelines more Christians than anything else. It's this idea of thinking that your gift is less important than the people who sing on Sundays and the guy who preaches. And so what you think is, man, I really can't be used God by God to make a big difference. I, I'm, real, I'm not making near the impact that he is or she is. No, listen, that is from the enemy. Throw it away and don't pick it back up. Because what my Bible has just said is that your gift, which by the way, this the, the, the uh, motivational gifts, the Bible says every single Christian has one of these gifts. So you might not have a manifestation gift, you might not have a ministry gift, but every person in this room and watching online who has surrendered their life to Jesus, you have one of these gifts. And my Bible says that your creator who knows all things, who's all powerful and all loving, decided that for you and your life and your time and this point in time in history, you needed the gift that you have. Stay away from the spirit of comparison. Yes. Amen? Yes. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Man, let us use them. Yes. So many Christians right now. Man, there are some of you sitting in here right now. You have the gift of worship. You have the gift of playing an instrument. And you are not using your gifts to glorify your heavenly father. And there are so many other gifts and talents that many of you have that have been given to you by your creator. The question is, and what I always want you to ask yourself, whatever you're good at, what are you good at? 
That thing right there, maybe it's art, maybe it's drawing, maybe it's singing, maybe it's business, maybe it's being a stay-at-home mom, maybe it's raising children. The gift that you have, the thing that you're good at, are you using that to bring glory to your heavenly father? Because remember, our gifts are given to us not for our own sake, but for Lord, the Lord's sake and bringing glory to his name. Let us use them. I'll go as far to say this, Christian, it's not really an option. You really don't get to pick and choose whether you're going to be who God's called you to be. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus and you're willing to accept what that means for you, which means you're going to spend eternity in a place you can't fathom in your wildest imagination, we've got to get up off the bench and be the men and women who God has called us to be. And a lot of you are struggling to experience fulfillment right now as a human being, and I would be willing to bet it's because you're not being this person. When Christians don't feel fulfilled in their life, whole, It means they are not being who God has called them to be. Well, Pastor Zach, I don't know what that means. Go on the journey. Because even in the journey, I'll go as far to say this, um, the journey is the destination. Uh, Let's let's think about that for a moment. This is in my notes. I'm just going to run with this, see what happens. The journey is the destination. There are so many times in my life growing up, in fact, I think my dad just said it to me this past week. We went to Louisiana and visited our family. I'd always look forward to, you know, school ending or the state championship game or this thing or that thing. And my dad would always say this. I'm going to put it on his tombstone one day. Hey, son, make sure you enjoy the journey. And I think what happens to us as Christians, and I, somebody needs to hear this. I'm about to break this thing. <clears throat> somebody needs to hear this. This is, this is really good. This is important. I think this is the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes for us as Christians, we, we get caught up in this utopian world, this idea of what we think Christianity is going to be. And so we think and we struggle with these thoughts of, okay, if I, if I love Jesus, if I go to church at least three times a month, if I tithe, if I give above and beyond my tithe, if I go on at least one short-term mission trip in my life, if, I, if I'll lead a group, if I'll stop cussing, if I won't watch rated R movies, if I won't have more than two beers at a time, if I'll do these things, then God will do this for me. And your this is this, is this world or this life where your marriage isn't struggling, where, where there's no coronavirus, where there's no racial tension, where there's no uh, just crazy politics, where there's no financial strain, where there's no physical illness or death in your life. And what happens to us is we go on this journey because we think we're headed towards that. And I think what sometimes God is trying to remind us of is, listen, son, daughter, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Like, we, we, we should do this even in our human relationships. We need to enjoy. We get so caught up in the end. We get so caught up in the destination that we miss the journey. And look, as human beings, many of you have already experienced this. One of the best parts about vacation is the anticipation leading up to the vacation. You know, it's, it's those moments that, that builds up and that excitement and that anticipation. And it's, it's the journey, man. Listen to me. Here's my point. It's the journey with Jesus, my friend. That's what matters. That is, as long as we're breathing air on this planet, listen to me, your destination, this is so good, your destination is not going to change. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, my friend, nothing, everyone say nothing, nothing. can change that. Your destination is set. That's why our future hope is in Jesus in eternity. Nothing can change that. So if nothing can change that, then what we need to do right now is, yes, live with an eternity in mind, but we need to enjoy the journey. Because as long as we're breathing air on this planet, as imperfect human beings who love Jesus, the destination for us is the journey. It is the journey. And, and look, sometimes we get so caught up in, in that place that we think we're headed for. On this earth, I'm not talking about eternity, but on this, a a perfect marriage or perfect children or no financial struggle or no health issues. And we get so caught up in striving for that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for those things. But we can get so caught up in that that we miss those moments with Jesus. 
Listen, what I love about the Psalms and, and, and studying David, first of all, studying the life of David reminds me I'm not that crazy, all right? Dude's crazy. He's an emotional roller coaster. Makes me feel a little bit better as well. Man, what I'll, listen, here, what I love about the life of David, and there are so many lessons we can learn from him. What I've learned from the life of David is that his most intimate moments with Jesus and his creator were in the worst seasons of his life. Now listen, you're not going to want to hear this, but I want you to grab hold of this idea right now. And this, this is in my notes. I believe this is the Holy Spirit. Right now, so many of us, and I've, I've been guilty of this, we're ready for the pandemic to end. We're ready for COVID to move on. We're ready for the racial issues to, 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 to go to the wayside and we'll not hear about them anymore. We're ready for this election to be over with. Because a lot of this stuff is creating chaos in our world, in our lives, especially as Americans. We're a little spoiled. We're not used to this stuff. But here's what I would say. We need to pray that God's will be done. But listen to me. We need to enjoy the journey. And here's what I mean by that. Right now, some of you are experiencing some of the most intimate moments that you've had with Jesus in a really long time. Don't wish that away. Enjoy these moments. It's in the valleys. It's in the storms. It's in the test. It's in persecution where we thrive. Can I just remind you as the church, we've been here before. Now, for you as an individual, this is all new to you. I understand that. Same it is for me. But the church, we've been here before. The church has survived war and famine and pandemics. Nothing is going to stop the church. Nothing's going to stop the ecclesia. And so what we've got to do is we've got to stay focused on Jesus. Yes. And he, hey, listen. Hear this, what will take your focus off of Jesus quicker than anything? Fear. Fear. And so what begins to happen, and here's the temptation for many of us as believers right now and those watching online. The temptation is to face the coronavirus, to face the tension in our culture, to face the uncertainty of politics and our nation and our finances. Now watch this, here's the temptation for us as Christians. The temptation is to figure it out ourselves. So I'm going to take control of my health. I'm going to take control of, of uh, uh, my posts and things that I say, and I'm going to make sure people know where I stand on certain issues. And what begins to happen as soon as we take control, then God leaves us to our own vices, including our emotions. And so the challenge to all of us in this room and those watching online right now, listen, yes, let's be wise with our health. Yes, let's be wise with our finances. Yes, let's get out and vote and do the things that we need to that line up with our convictions. But listen to me, watch this. No matter what we decide to do, Jesus still has to stay the focus. He still has to be the focus. Because we sit in the palm of his hand. Not a president, not a government, not a pandemic, not a country, not a skin color. We sit in the palm of his hand. So we have to stay focused on him. And what we can't do is give in to fear. Yes. Now, look, I, I know we've heard that message for the past three months since this whole corona thing started. We've heard that over and over and over. And preachers and churches have pre uh, uh, preached messages and series on it. There have been books written in the midst of this of not giving in the fear, but giving in to faith. I understand that. But I think if we were all honest with one another, you could probably preach the very message I just gave you, but we have a problem with living that message. And so what we need to do in the midst of this is we've got to capture our thoughts. Because listen to me, God's watching. We all understand that, right? I mean, he is all-knowing, all-seeing. He's watching our faith right now, my friend. And let me remind you the simple definition of faith. It's confidence in God. And I don't know about you, but for me as a 32-year-old American, my faith has been tested, but it's never been tested like this. It has never been tested on this scale for me as a millennial. But I am being tested, just like you're being tested. 
And here's what I find myself doing. I have the same thoughts that you do. You know what I do, though? I grab them. I capture those thoughts, and I lay them down. What I don't do is dwell on them and, and play the what-if game and try to run this thing out as if I can control or change anything. I mean, the Bible says don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, worry about itself. What's the point? God's got you. Can I remind you of that? He's got you. He's got you. Now, listen, I need to explain that statement as I close up today. I'm not even going to get to my other points. I need to explain that statement. God's got you. Now, listen to me. It does not mean you won't get sick. God's got you does not mean you won't have financial struggles. God's got you does not mean that our nation is going to be perfect five or ten years from now. God's got you means he has sent his son to die on the cross for you. And if you've surrendered your life to him, nothing can change your eternity. That's what God's got you means. Listen, Paul says, hey, to, to die is gain, but to live is Christ. Paul understood the worst thing you can do to me, and at the same time, the best thing you can do to me is kill me. Why? Because we get to spend eternity with Jesus. Nothing can change that. So if nothing changes that, then why are we living in fear? Man, God's got you. I'm not saying that tomorrow's not going to be difficult. And I'm not saying that it's not a weight on you as a husband to provide for your family, not knowing if you're going to have a job next month. I'm not saying those things aren't difficult, and I'm not saying that they're not hard. What I'm telling you is that in the face of that, if there's anything we learn from the Apostle Paul, is that it's in the face of persecution, it's in the face of death, that's when the church gets to stand and say, you know what, but God's got me. Because what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give in to fear. Because watch this. It does nothing for you. Your fear does not keep you healthy. Your fear does not fix your bank account. Your fear does not fix your marriage. Your fear stands in the way of you being focused on the one true king, Jesus Christ. So listen, my hope today is that... Yeah, you don't walk out of here like, hey, hey, can I just be honest with you? Is it a safe place? Can I be honest? Those of you watching online, I'm be honest with you. <laughs> it's funny how the Lord does this to me. Driving the church this morning, because I, I received some um, articles and some videos and some, uh, which I receive a lot of right now, like conspiracy theories on the all-time highs. Everybody realize that? It's like a black hole, okay? Like you can spend the next three months just going through conspiracy theories, right? So I get a lot of that. Hey, preachers, you see this? Hey, have you watched this? Hey, what do you think about this? I get that a lot. It's normal. And I, and I, had, a, I had a really bad dream last night. In fact, it woke me up, and, and, and I just stayed awake for like an hour just thinking through it. And so on the way to church this morning, I told my wife, I'm like, man, I just feel down. I feel, I feel hopeless, and I feel down. If I'm just being honest with you, this is, I know I'm a pastor. I know you think we're not supposed to feel that way, but I am a human. And I just felt that way. And I know there are a lot of you right now, you feel the same way. Those of you right now, despite the fact you're sitting in Hell's Gate on your awesome boat watching the message, you feel that way, right? It's what we do with those thoughts and those feelings that determine our journey. We do not allow our feelings and emotions to lead us. We lead them. So what do I do as a Christian when I feel that way? What do I, what do, I do as a Christian when my tomorrow is full of uncertainty? Here's what I do. I grab hold of the anchors in my life. What is my anchor? Jesus. Now, I know that sounds cheesy and cliche, and we've seen it on T-shirts and coffee mugs, but it's true. Nothing can change that. You can take away my job. You can take away my bank account. You can take away my family. You can take away um, the things that I have. You can take all those things away from me. Watch this. What do you have? A son of God. You have a son of God. I'm still Zach Greider, the son of the one true king. Take all those things from me. Now, I want those things, and please don't take them. But listen to me. Even if they were taken, I am still a son of God who has a reason to live, and I have a purpose on this planet. Yes, right. Listen to me. The same is true for you. Yes. If you lose your health, you lose your finances, you lose your job, you lose your stuff, you lose your freedom. At the end of the day, what are you left with? A son 
or a daughter of the one true king, and nothing can change that. That's what we put our hope in. Come on, somebody. That's where our hope's at. But God's got you. He's got you. So what is the purpose of the church? It's to be the light on the hill, to share the very things that I was just sharing with you. So here's my encouragement. Again, share on Facebook. Go and tell your friends. Everything that I just told you, I'm not, I'm not special and privy to that information. You have the same information, the same Bible I do. So my hope is that you walk out of here today full of hope and excitement. Like, man, like nothing is going to change my eternity. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. And even if they take everything from me, I'm still a son. I'm still a daughter, which means God has a plan for my life. Amen. And we're not finished yet. And even if we were, worst case, even if we were, you can't imagine what you're going to step into when you move on from this life. You can't imagine. Amen? Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, we lift you up this morning. Thank you so much for who you are. And God, I just pray uh, that the message we just heard, this message of hope, of, of staying focused on Jesus, Lord, you, you had a plan. You interrupted my message and my plans and my notes to, to share this message of hope. God, I pray that this seed would take root in our hearts. And God, for us as Christians, we would take this out. We would share it with our spouses, with our kids, with our loved ones, with our coworkers, and with our communities. And when people are asking us questions out of fear, they're making decisions out of fear, God, that we would be the ones as the church to be the light on the hill and appoint them to you and the hope that we have in you. So Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're in control. And we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son, Jesus, to die for us. May we live in light of that hope. Thank you, Lord. Perhaps you're watching today and you'd say, Jeff, you know, I don't have this God thing figured out yet. As a matter of fact, I have my doubts on if I'm going to be with God in his heaven forever. Well, friend, I just want to encourage you to recognize something. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he would love to do something for you right now that you can't do for yourself. He'd like to forgive your sins, past, present, and future. The question is, is why not let him do it now? Now you might be watching and you think, Jeff, I don't know how to do that. Friend, there was a time when I didn't know how to either and someone offered to help me meet the Lord in my heart, be forgiven of my sins by praying a simple prayer with them. And I took them up on their offer and I'm eternally grateful that I did. Friend, it would be my privilege now to help you pray a similar prayer to meet Christ in your heart and be forgiven. So I'll pray and you pray right now, right after me, and you can settle the issue with God once and for all. Pray like this. Lord Jesus, I'm choosing to trust in you right now. I'm choosing right now to believe that you're God's son and that when you conquered sin and death and came out of the grave, I'm choosing to believe that you did that for me. And I'm asking you right now to come into my life, to take over my life, and to forgive me of all of my sins, past, present, and future. Pray this, friend. Lord Jesus, starting right now, I'm not gonna live my life my way any longer. Starting right now, I'm gonna live my life for you. Pray this, thank you, Lord, for just now hearing my prayer. And it's in your name that I pray, amen. So friend, if you just prayed with me and you chose to trust Christ with your life and be forgiven of your sins, would you do me a favor? And right now, would you click the link that's on the bottom of this page and just let us know what's happened. Just let us be able to celebrate with you. We would love to start encouraging your life. We'd love to help you to learn how to walk with the Lord. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching, and thank you for trusting Christ with your life. Thanks again for joining us today online. If you made a decision to take a step toward Christ, just text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. As a church, it is our hope to help you continue to grow in your relationship with Christ and deepen your faith. Parents, church isn't over for you and your kids. We have a worship experience, especially for you and your children, that includes a time of worship, a weekly lesson, and a scripture memory verse. Visit the link below to access this content and get ready for tons of fun.
We want to make sure that you stay connected with everything that's happening at High Ridge. The best way to do that is by following us on all social media platforms, subscribing to our YouTube channel, or by checking out our website. Here at High Ridge, we give as an expression of worship and as a display of our relationship with Christ. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, God loves a cheerful giver. You can give most easily online through the High Ridge app or check out the link below for additional giving options for your campus. Thank you, High Ridge family, for faithing forward with your finances.